Hey, everybody. It's Parvesh China here from NBC's Connecting and a bunch of other cartoons your kids might watch. I'm here with my friend Elias, and we're on the Man Cave Chronicles. Welcome to another episode of the Man Cave Chronicles. Welcome to the party, pal. You're my boy, bro. Yo, it. I did it. A podcast with interviews of amazing guests from the world of pop culture. Oh, yeah. TV. Nice. Movies. Oh, I love the movies. Comedy and more from deep inside the Man Cave. Your host, Elias. Arvesh, welcome to the cave. Hey, Elias. Thanks for having me. How are you, man? What's new with you? You know, still still at home, still in quarantine, but I actually am good because I have a TV show coming out. That's right. That's right. Home, so. yeah. yeah, life life could be worse. Yeah. And I, I know it's hard for a lot of people, but my immediate life, I can't complain. Right. Uh, without doing the show before that, like, how were you? How did the whole cor- whole quarantine treat you? Um, well, you know, like, do you even remember March 2020? <laughs> My God. Yes. Back then, seriously, so many stages to the pandemic, right? Right, right. We, um, what, um, before, before I got this show, I got connecting in July. It was actually a birthday gift. I got it on my birthday. Before then, like everyone, like other actors, I'm just like, how are we going to get back to filming? Are we okay? Um, unemployment? How do I fill you out? To, um, I do a lot of voiceover too. And, you know, that's just been like, I call like sometimes like the TV or movie jobs kind of feel like, you know, like hitting the jackpot or, you, right. you know, you won the slot machine kind of voiceover commercials for a working, working actor, working guy union man like me that's what i like budget that's where i pay rent make the you know the grocery budget from so i was very lucky that you know i have the microphone i made that little bit of a sound box in my closet and i've been able to record some of like my disney cartoons from home so that was you know i was like all right at least i have this and then luckily fortunately for me connecting came my way at the end of July and this has been my life since so like there was kind of a pandemic part of like before connecting and then a pandemic part where it's been after connecting for me so that's awesome. it just it really has been a like a yeah. pre as pre connecting pandemic and post connecting pandemic before we talk about connecting I know you've been vi- you've been busy throughout the years you know we have outsourced uh, crazy ex-girlfriend a lot of voiceover work and, you know, of course, you have yeah. Connecting that's going to premiere on Peacock. But uh, I want the listeners to get to know a little bit more about you. Uh, where are you originally from? Yeah, I'm a Chicagoan. I'm a suburbanite outside of Chicago. I grew up in Aurora and Naperville. My family's still out there. And I'm lucky that Chicago is such a great theater and TV town. You know, like ER was very big when I was in college. And I got my big break on Barbershop 1 and 2 that filmed in Chicago. I was in college. I think I skipped class to go to an audi- to go to that first audition. And then that brought me out to L.A. So, the, yeah, I'm a Midwesterner, born and bred, deep dish pizza guy. And now I'm an Angelino for, <laughs> what are we, what year is it? 2020? 14? No, oh my gosh, I, don't, I do know math. 16 years wow. I've been in L.A. So... Do I wait to 20 years before it makes me a true Angelino? I don't know. <laughs> How old were you where you kind of had an idea this is what you wanted to do and get into? Um, I think I was probably 10 years old, fifth grade at Georgetown Elementary School in Aurora, Illinois. I got to play King George the Third, And um, I, I think my line was, off with his head, which I don't think is a very British royalty line to say, but in this bastardized elementary school production, I did get to say that, and I got a laugh, and that was it. Wow. You know, as actors, someone laughs at us, someone claps at us, you're hooked. Well, so when you, at what age did you start like taking acting classes? Um, because education was to like kind of the focus, especially being the child of. Indian immigrants here, education, education, education. Right. My first acting class, luckily in 
the birds was in high school. We had theater arts one and two, you know, the power of great public arts education. I, um, you know, my high school, Wabanzi Valley in Aurora, Illinois was, you know, Wayne's world, Aurora, Illinois That's right. was doing, we were doing like upwards of like eight shows a year from like musicals, freshman plays, senior directed one acts that I did my senior year. So I didn't take like a proper, like non-school acting class until like my mid twenties, everything else was just high school and then at university. Hmm. So when you told your, because you said you came from a, a family, it was all about education, education, education. When you told your family that you wanted to get into the entertainment industry, how did that go? Oh, I lied. <laughs> I flat out lied. I told them, um, because this was a very like late 90s thing to do. For if you're going to go major in theater, you would tell, um, you would tell your parents and the schools you were applying to like, oh, I'm going to be double majoring in psychology. You know, it was a very late 90s thing. Like, oh, you don't know what you want to do or you don't want to commit to your art. Just do a double major in psychology, right? Because then that's fine for when you go to grad school or lawyers or, or law school. So I full on, and they know this now because they started, they didn't mind as much when I started paying my own rent. But I did lie. I lied when I was 18, going on 19, year old, saying like, oh, I'm going to double major in psychology as well so that was kind of the acceptance and lucky me booking some commercials let alone a feature film during college they kind of they forgot about the <laughs> psychology lie really quickly wow. but no i did i did lie i did i full on lied because i just thought that we have this whole stereotype and trope about and i'm going to speak specifically to asian children of immigrants, because that's what I can only speak to. Our parents, when they came here, you know, and that's that brain drain of the late 60s, early 70s that, you know, Johnson and then Nixon enacted, uh, the Chinese Exclusion Immigrant Act of 20, 1925 was over because now America needed scientists, doctors, mathematicians, engineers. My dad, all of his friends were engineers. They came here when they were like 21, 22, 23. And I mean, we talk about, we are having this open discussion with race, you know, across the world, let alone in America, finally. And I do see like their point of view, their perspective in late sixties, you know, this is right after civil rights movements was get a job where no one can be in charge of you. You know, like a doctor, engineer, it's very hard for there to be someone who just tells you to, like, go sweep the floor yeah. or, you know, clock in or whatnot. So that was their perspective. They did not want us to be in an industry where I'm still struggling with it, you know, where we, how many accent roles have I played? You know, I'm born, bred, and raised. I joked, I would always joke with my friends, like, I'm pretty much a white suburban woman. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, I am. I am very much like my friends, Amy and Monica from, you know, from growing up who they have kids and, you know, they have Tupperware and longer burger basket parties and, you know, PTA and homeowners association. So it has been a struggle sometimes to be like, okay, yeah, I know ethnically I'm like this, but Amy and Monica aren't playing like, they're not, ex they're not playing Polish grandmothers and Italian mom so it's it's a very interesting time so i do see and this is why we've had that thing of you know asian parents study don't do anything fun it's just that their fear was that we were not going to get a fair shake or be treated so differently you know like a lot of my black friends were like i don't know i don't know for how much longer i can just keep playing the maid or slave in these period pieces you know yeah. i have i know nothing about this born in phoenix <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah it makes sense so it, it's been very but that's where that stems from a bit it's like mm. our parents did not want us to struggle and have someone subjectively say like oh you're not right for it when you can never prove it but they're like you're too brown you know the, the character is jack and i'm like yeah i know a lot of asian friends named jack too we can do it <laughs> that's right that's right so yeah so now about your new show nbc connecting it's going to premiere on peacock yeah how did that all actually, start? Elias, it's actually going to be on NBC. It will be. First. 
Okay. It will be Thursday nights at 8.30, 7.30 Central. Next day, Peacock. Ah, uh, okay. So, like, yeah. So, so it will how, be one of those shows. So, how did that all about happen? Like, was this, like, somebody that just came up with the idea when the pandemic started? You know, I think a lot of the networks, is like, there are a couple of the, you know, quarantine pandemic-related shows out there from, like, Freeform, Netflix, um, the one for, but those have been kind of like specials or movies. Ours is an ongoing regular series. You know, we, our showrunners, you know, the head writers, Martin Jero and Brandon Gall, who are from The Blind Spot. They're already like in the NBC family. And, you know, the, Martin also has Kung Fu, the reboot on CW. So they're prolific guides. You know, the fact that they can go from like hour long, you know, espionage spy drama to, you know, the CW martial arts, to a half-hour comedy. Like, it just shows, like, they're very talented and can speak to a lot. Martin and Brendan, they kind of based our show about a group of friends based on their own group of friends during pandemic. You know, a lot of them play poker on VR. Okay. You know, like those virtual, you know, poker rooms. So yeah. that is where it all started. They wanted to see the lens of America, you know, like how any television is, you know, we are, we're, it's not the end all be all everyone's pandemic experience, but it is the pandemic experience of these group of seven friends from Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. So I really, this believe it or not, is like one of the closest to chest closest to my real life parts situations that I've ever had to play with, you know? So how do you audition for something like this? I got the audition on a Thursday, like, I, this was, like, end of July. Like, okay. you, you know, like, a few days, like, I want to say, like, July 18th, 19th, around there. I got the audition, so much material, and my agent was like, it's due at the end of the day. And I was like, oh, wow, how are you going to do this? And I, without any shame, I put all of the lines in a teleprompter app on my iPhone because it's the audition is, you know, we're a zoom, we're zoom calls. We're right. FaceTime, you know? And the very first thing it said is the, uh, you know, my character is on his phone hiding from his children in the laundry room. So I, or in a closet. So I was like, okay, this works. This all tracks. I don't need to have like a, a set camera or I'm not, you know, talking to someone in the room. I'm literally using and talking to my phone. So I did my entire audition tape in a closet looking at the lines on my thumb. Yeah, that's awesome. How, how long before was you, very how long was it before full. you heard uh, you got a call back? Uh, two days. Wow. Two days, two days later, call back with Martin and Brendan and then that was it. And then two days after that, on my birthday, July 22nd, I got the news. That's awesome. How would you, so the character that you play, I couldn't find anything on IMDb about your character. What's the name of your character and, and how would you describe him? Well, his, his, the character's name is Pradeep. P-R-A-D-E-E-P. -E -E and that's an Indian name. My best friend uh, growing up, another Indian American guy who I've known since fourth grade i want to say known danny since fourth or fifth grade um his his actual birth name is pradeep and so the character that i auditioned for was just darius and we talked after i got cast the writers brendan martin and i we decided we we discussed they asked like do you have any suggestions for names so i was like aha let me write let me give you some suggestions so i wrote this like long ass email of um, I came up with three and my suggestions were one, keep it as Darius you know, you can just, I can just be an Indian American dude named Darius Yeah. I came up with Pradeep because that is my, my best friend growing up who's Indian I've always been Parvesh you know, I go by Parv or Parvi but I never like had the Americanized name, you know like, uh, you know like there'll be someone, you know, who's like you know, it might have this really long family name, but it might be shortened down to Sam or Raj. You know how like Rajiv's and Rajesh's get shortened to Raj because everyone know Americans know that Raj can be Roger. Hmm. But for D, 
Deep, his pet name just growing up, because it was just a different time, you know, like we and um, kids can be cruel, especially to new names that they don't know. So he went by Danny when we were in school. But I, I suggested Pradeep. And then I'd actually also suggested because I have a cousin named Karin. And he, it's a, it can, it's one of those unisex names, too, in um, in India. Like Karin Brar is a, a big Disney Channel kid actor. He's lovely. He's great. And so I was like, what about Karin? Because I wouldn't mind the, you know, the mistake of like when people were like, when Americans would be Karen, you know, because we have all of our, how Karens have entered the slang and lexicon right now. And they went with Pradeep. And I'm like, that's great. That's one of the three I offered. And because it, it was dear to me, I know Pradeep's. And um, that's how we came up with the name. Mm. We also, you know, have you noticed like how South Asians, you know, people of Indian descent from India, from the diaspora, we haven't fully embraced American names. Like my e- further East Asian friends, people of like Korean, Japanese, Chinese descent, like Julia Cho's and Eddie Liu's, yeah. you know, and Albert Wong or Justin Lin. Notice like how they've embraced the Western first name, but all my other friends like Sonal, Janina's, Utkarsh's, Rubby's, we, we haven't done it yet. <laughs> I think maybe our children's children will start being called like, hi, I'm Mike Singh China. This is my sister, Jennifer. <laughs> Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's right. We're, we're a generation away. Mm-hmm. Generation away from that. So, but yeah, and he's, and Pradeep also is, he's a, he's a dad with two kids and partnered and he's just going through it. Like uh, he is just that parent who is trying to, can I swear, Elias? I yeah. always forget. Yeah, that's fine. He's trying to get the fuck away from his kids. <laughs> I know that feeling, trust me. Very <laughs> short. <laughs> How many do you have? I have I have uh, two young kids. I have a five year old daughter and a three year old son. They're a handful. Okay, do you know what is Yeah, they're that's about the age of the children the character of the kids of my characters kids' ages. I think four and two, maybe, or th- but five and three. So, like, you get it. Yeah, I sure do. Yeah. So, like, so playing this character and on, you know, like on a Zoom style video, did you have a hard time connecting with the character? Any challenges? It's a combination. Um, since we're doing everything, like, there is the only help I've ever had is just like when my partner was home. You know, we had some night shoots and he was. He would help out, and but he he's a he's actually in in tech and um, on logistic teams, and he's been going in because like his team is like so you know like so for the other twenty or to fifty people who get to work from home, there's supposed to be like one to ten people who need to go into the office. That was him. So I'm alone. Like we have we set up our cameras, we do our own hair, makeup, wardrobe, lighting, sound art department art and that means like you know the the props the paintings the furniture like we rearrange all that i have like a kid's like not bouncy house but like that little like house shelter kind of thing in the middle of my apartment and that's where i keep like a lot of the camera and lighting equipment in it Mm. so i we do it all alone and i it it, it is interesting because like you forget at the end of the day that you still have to act too. You know, it's not just enough to like have everything set up. Like you have to know your lines and intentions. So the thing that's nice about the deep is I am playing them close to my chest. You know, like I, I'm not a chameleon actor. I play, you're going to get just different one degree variations of part. Mm. And so it's nice to know like, okay, my friends with kids got it. I'm partnered. I can tap into that frustration pandemic. Oh, we're good. I don't have to really stretch here. You know, Shakespeare, it is not for me. There are no wigs. There are no false teeth. It's just kind of parvation. Hmm. How, uh, how many like hours a day were you? Uh, so you filmed eight episodes, right? We're, we're, we filmed so far six. We're on break right now this week, and we start up again Monday. How long does it take to film so got, um, one episode? Um, the shortest? for me was just two days of filming and those were really quick because it wasn't a big episode for me and then 
Other weeks, it's been regular five day, 10, 12 hours, you know? Yeah. Wow. Because it's extra time, too, because all that stuff that we actors forget, you know, like my call time might be 10, 10 a.m. on a set, but that still means that someone, other people have been there since 7, 8, 9 a.m., right? Mm. Setting up, getting everything charged, you know, like getting everything done. So, like, when I get there, I can just hop in the wardrobe, have someone put makeup and do my hair, and then I just go to, you know, and then I just recite my lines. So that's why it can be a little longer, but um, I don't know. Maybe it's just my puritanical upbringing, but I like working. You know, I feel like I like a busy day. I like that earned, like, you know, at the end of a night kind of thing. Yeah, it makes you feel good. So, yeah, it does. It makes me, I, I, I would rather work a long day than a quick short one sometimes, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I noticed that uh, Preacher Lawson is on the show. I had him on a while back. He's a funny, funny guy. He's such a sweetheart. Just a good soul, a good egg. He's a mama's boy. You know, we we FaceTimed and Zoomed with his mom. She's there. And he's just a, do you know what I mean? Like a good egg, a good soul. I hope that's not condescending. I just mean like, because he's, he's a kid to me. Like, he's so young. And he's got like his whole career ahead of him. And he's just got such a nice spirit about it. And he, I think at like our first table read or something, he reminded like a lot of us, like he was like, you know, this was the dream, like to get on a sitcom. You know, why do so many stand ups comedians do it? You know, there are other people who just want to just want to have that stand up life. You know, they want to be in control. They want to just say their stuff, collect their money, go home. I like him because he's, you just got a good sense about it, good sen- a good sense of self, as any, let alone an actor has to, but a comedian does. And he's just game. You know, he'll play, and what he, a few times when he didn't know something or because it, some things are new for him, he asks. There's no pretension, no pomposity. And what else can you want from, like, you know, someone in their 20s who is, you know, a comedian known all, all around the country? Right, right. Um, when is the show premiering? Thursday, October 1st. Is there a certain slot time? That, it will be that... on, I want to say, 8, 8.30. I think we share the hour with Superstorm. Okay. Right. Now, how did you get involved with the voiceover work? You know, voiceover work, you know how some actors might say like, oh, 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 I only do drama. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I, I'm, I just do, I'm just a stage actor, you know? Yeah. I come from the mindset like work, again, like what we're, I guess we're talking about work and ethics today, that everything is a job, you know? Like I came from stage, I came from improv and sketch, but I work, I like to make the money in TV and film. Voiceover, we all watched cartoons growing up. Like why would you not want to be a part of it? I got really lucky at the, during Outsource where I booked a Transformers cartoon called Rescue Bots. And to this day, some of those actors from it, are, we have a WhatsApp group. I'm doing Jason Marsden, uh, who's one of, you know, he was a child actor on, you yep. know, Step by Step. And he's, you know, I'm doing his online show. And Nicole Dubuque, our showrunner, is at Nickelodeon. We're, also, we also work together, still friends. So it's such a lovely community. But for me, I loved it because, as a person, you know, of non-white descent, it was just great to finally play characters that the color of my skin or my name had nothing to do with it, with the casting of it. Like, you know, like of course I'll play Indian, Indian American parts too. But it's nice to be like, oh yeah, Parvesh can be that angry rock. Oh, let's have Parvesh be the voice of of uh, freedom. You know, like these yeah. abstract concepts. I, play, you know, like I play a stork on Taj. I play, you know, I play, and I do play Indian characters on like Mira Royal Detective or Gee Happy. You know, this new one. So it's just there's so much freedom, and you can't see. You know, you can't, you have to develop and make character just based on one part of your, one instrument of your life. Mm. And I'm just fortunate. I've got some stuff coming out soon that, 
you know, for Netflix, let alone for Disney. And it's, I, I always say like voiceover is the money and the work that I live off of. You I think know, it, I think it's I awesome. Voiceover work. I, it's the best because everyone is nice. Every there's, there's such joy in the voiceover community. Mark Hamill, you know, our uncle Mark, is one of the stars who records with you. He's not a, he does not go, he doesn't record before or after, you know, the main cast. He comes in, sits down. He knows half of the cast anyway. He and Maurice LaMarche, you know, who's the voice of the brain, of thinking the brain, even on the, and then that's back on, you know, for Animaniacs. That's right. They're old friends. Just like, there's no ego when it comes to voiceover, because everyone knows what a fun, great job it is to have and how fortunate they are because it can be quick. It can be a long ass day too, but I just find that everyone is so grateful and happy to be there. And you can play so many, like in 10 minutes, I could give you 10 different characters. You know, I could give you 10 different versions of that person. So I, I don't know why I'm thinking about uncle Mark today because he's just, he will always be Luke Skywalker to all of us, but then to so many people, he's going to be the Joker, you know, or he'll be from like the Batman animated series that we grew up with. Like, mm. I just think of him as that person who is like, that's a voiceover actor. That, that's what voiceover actors are like LeVar Burton, Lacey Chabert, mm. people who are famous for their on camera work, but that's their like day to day work, bread and butter. That's mm. what we do. My first, I think gig back, we weren't on the same gig, but Sarah Michelle Geller in the parking lot, you know, even with these all, all these new COVID rules, you know, where we it's very safe and one person at a time. Voiceovers are actually one of the best jobs that you can do during the pandemic, during stricter social distancing, because the times I've gone into the studio, it's just me and the engineer and the engineers on the other side of the glass and the directors, writers, producers are on Zoom. Hmm. So it's been really lovely to get to keep working in that field you're giving me all the feels today elias i'm I missing my voiceover friend <laughs> who uh one more voiceover question for you who's been your favorite character that you After- voiced you know i will have a soft spot for blades that was my transformers character because i'm an 80s kid you know i'm re-watching thundercats on hulu right now that's right it's on there this is right i mean that original 80s 84, 85 Transformers cartoon was everything. And to be like in that world in some way, I have like, you know, drawings that people send you uh, or, you know, like I have this little stuffed doll that someone made me a blade that I always just travel with. And I do thank him for, and, you know, and Nicole and, and um, Brian Holfeld, who, you know, they were the showrunners for Rescue Bots with Jeff Klein, a producer. They gave me that big job. Really quick, Brian Holfeld, and he also did uh, Winnie Pooh, Christopher Robin and Winnie, and Winnie the Pooh in the 90s. Brian is grew up with Ken Quapis, that, you know, that writer-director of, like, he does the pilots of The Office, Bernie Mac show, Larry Sanders show. He also directed the pilot of Outsource. So that time, 2010, 2011, these two men, Ben Quapis, Brian Holfeld, who are friends in real life, you know, Brian was, Ken's first movie he directed was Follow That Bird in, you know, in the 80s, the Sesame Street movie, and Brian's in it. I will, I even saw them in New York. We all were in New York randomly one year, and we had dinner, and then I went to go see Hamilton when it was just at the public. And I just remember leaving being like, those two men are responsible for my on camera and my voiceover career. So I'm very grateful to them and blades, blades, especially it's a fun one. That's the one where I still get calls from friends to leave like birthday messages or do your homework messages to their children. So I, I actually told my daughter last night that I was going to talk to stork from the tots and she was all excited about it. Hey, <laughs> um, Bodie, the big stork. That's right. That's right. Uh, I I, I get to play like and Bodie's fun too because like I get to you forget we get to sing a lot. Yeah. In um cartoons, so it's it's so surreal to see like cast recordings like Tots, 
season one on iTunes, and you're like, "Holy shit, that's me!" <laughs> any uh, any other <laughs> any any other upcoming projects that you uh, want to plug away that you can tell that you can talk about? There's always that thing of like, I don't know what I can say. I've got a guest star coming up. Um, no, I'm so sorry, Elias. I can't. I don't know if I can say it yet. Okay. But I do have some work coming up, and then. Let me try to say voiceover work. I can say tops. We've got season three. We're already recording for. We just started recording for season three. That's I can. I know I can mention that. So tell your kids definitely more is coming. They got plenty of Casey, uh, Pip, and Freddie coming their way. And um, Mira, Royal Detective. I don't know if the little one watches that one yet, but that's that's also for Disney Junior. That has been a very special project, too. Um, Mirror Royal Detective is the first all South Asian cast cartoon for Disney. We, that was my last big public like event where I saw like so many friends. Red carpet at Walt Disney Studios was for Mira. I, if I, I think I can do this even correctly. I think it was March 9th, March 8th or 9th before the quarantine started for us here in LA on, on March 11th. But Mira, we're also on that season two. And that's just such a thrill because every friend I have who's in the industry, who's an actor is, is on the show. And if they haven't been on the show, the, the producers, Sasha Palladino, uh, Becca Topol, they're just like, Oh, suggest them, bring them in. Oh, yep. We're going to be bringing in your friend, Janina. I'm like, awesome. You know, it's just been really I, I love the collaboration. And you get to work with your friends. Isn't that, I mean, like, what else can you ask for? I like, know. all I want to do is work with my friends. That's great. So Tots and Mirror Royal Detective, for the kids out there, they should be really lucky. And I hope that the parents who watch it with them, too, get enough of, like, you know, the little adult jokes. And, you know, it's definitely a dad joke for your dads out there, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, lastly, uh, how can they, how can the listeners, uh, find you on social media? Well, social media, I'm on the Twitter at Parvesh, my first name, E-A-R-V-E-S-H. And then on the Instagram, Parvi, like Harvey with a P at the beginning. <laughs> Parvish, this was fun. Uh, thank you uh, for coming on the show. Anytime. Thank you. And enjoy the man cave. That's a wrap. That's a wrap, everybody. That's a wrap. Thanks for listening to the Man Cave Chronicles podcast. I finally get my man cave. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at the MCC Podcast. And our website, themccpodcast.com. Until next time.